Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, and He will lift you up. Thinking about the idea that if you turn yourself over to God completely, if you are willing to trust in Him, if you're willing to bring yourself down and raise Him up, He will also lift you up. Let Him do the one. Let Him be the one who does the lifting, the heavy lifting, the one who's willing to lift your, your, the burdens off your shoulders, the, the sin off of your soul. Let Him be the one who heals you physically, spiritually. Let Him take control. You know, we talked about last week uh, the, the master's plan for the church. We talked about characteristics of the church, and we looked at Thessalonica, this church, and uh, as Paul writes in 1 Thessalonians, that, that they had many wonderful characteristics, and, and they ought to be the pattern we follow today. One of the characteristics was that they were willing to surrender themselves to God. They're willing to look beyond themselves. They're willing to look beyond their needs, their concerns, their wishes, and serve God. Even when persecution arose in Acts chapter 17, and some of the brothers were dragged throughout the streets, they were willing still to glorify God in all things. And I think about the idea of surrendering ourselves to God. You cannot surrender yourself to God unless you are first humble. That's a, that's a key word for today. Like, like I said, with, with uh, the song Mac chose, it's just perfect for this lesson because we're going to talk about humility. I love this quote, The first test of a truly great man, a truly great person, is in his humility. If you want to be great, if you desire to be great, you have to be like John. Do you remember John the Baptist? He said, I must decrease, he must increase. He must increase and I must decrease. John is saying, when he had his followers come and say, look, look, everybody's following Jesus. What are we going to do? John said, I'm thankful. I'm not the bridegroom. I'm a friend of the bridegroom. I'm here to celebrate that he has finally arrived. He has to come first. And I think about that idea. I think about humility. That that is something that often lacks in a person's life, in a Christian's life. The church needs more men and women who are willing to be humble. They're, 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 they're less willing to talk and more willing to listen. As, as we look at in James chapter 1, we've been talking about James a lot in our Sunday morning class. Remember, be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. Slow to anger. And I think about, you know, that is, that is a key to a healthy church. Individuals who are willing to listen. Individuals who are not quick uh, with their mouth or quick with anger and flashes of red hot heat with, with, with their minds and their actions, but they're willing to be patient, willing to be humble. I think of another quote. I found this uh, online. The humble man makes room for progress. The proud man believes he is already there. So, you know, often when a, a preacher preaches a sermon, there are individuals in the audience who think, you know, that was a good sermon. The elders really needed to hear that sermon. The deacons, oh, they really needed to hear that sermon. I hope the preacher was listening to what he was saying because he could use some humility. And I, I really hope sister so-and-so, brother so-and-so, you, you see the trap that we're falling into when we immediately think of those who really needed to hear about humility. Are we already perfect? Is there no room for improvement in our lives, in our souls? If we believe that we are where we need to be, perhaps we need to be less proud. And we need more humility. And, and sadly, again, another thing we might do is we may not say, well, I'm, per I'm not perfect, but at least I'm not like fill in the blank. Oh, you know, I make mistakes in my life, but at least I'm here and I'm not way, way down here. Or, oh, look at this brother down here. Oh, man, I'm glad I'm not like him or her. If we desire to draw close to God, we have to let go of ourselves. We have to learn to be humble. And I want to talk about this morning an individual who at first refused humility and he nearly lost it all including his own life. So join me together as we read God's Word, as we hear what He has trying to tell us about learning to trust in Him and letting go of ourselves as we look at a man named Naaman. Let's read together in, in 2 Kings chapter 5, beginning of verse 1. Naaman, commander of the army of the king of Syria, was a great man 
with his master and in high favor. Because by him the Lord had given victory to Syria. He was a mighty man of valor, but he was a leper. Now the Syrians on one of their raids had carried off a little girl from the land of Israel, and she worked in the service of Naaman's wife. And she said to her mistress, Would that my Lord were, the prophet, were with the prophet who is in Samaria. He would cure him of his leprosy. So Naaman went and told his Lord, Thus and so spoke the girl from the land of Israel. And the king said, Go now, and I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So he went, and taking with him ten talents of silver, six thousand shekels of gold, and ten changes of clothing. And he brought the letter to the king of Israel, which read, When this letter reaches you, know that I have sent to you Naaman, my servant, that you may cure him of his leprosy. And when the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his clothes and said, Am I God to kill and to make alive, that this man sends word to me to cure a man of his leprosy? Only consider and see how he is now quarreling with me. But when Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes, he said to the king, saying, Why have you torn your clothes? Let him come now to me, that he may know there is a prophet in Israel. So as we look at the first eight verses, we notice this man with a dilemma. He's a great man. Scripture tells us the man named Naaman. I want you to notice some of these characteristics. Everything we know about this man tells us that he is ex exceptional. He is a man of valor. He is a successful man. He's a commander in an army, which tells us that, that not only was he a commander of an army, but of a powerful, victorious army. He was a man who could handle responsibility. He could take charge. He could be a great leader. He had a great respect with his master, with his king. He had a good relationship with him. I mean, everything about Nam and even his name, which means pleasantness, tells us he was exceptional. Now, why was he so exceptional? Why was he so victorious? Why was he so perfect? Do you know why? Because the Lord was with him. You know, when we read all throughout Scripture, we read of individuals, despite where they currently were when God was with them, they became successful. I'll give you two names. One is Joseph. We looked at Joseph last year. In Genesis 39, 29, 21, even though Joseph was in prison, the Lord was with him and showed him steadfast love and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. Then if you're looking at the bulletin articles every week, you know we're talking about Daniel. We read in Daniel 1 verse 9, even though Daniel is currently captive, he's enslaved, he's being forced to serve a pagan king, and the Lord gave Daniel favor and compassion in the sight of the chief of eunuchs. But wait a minute, wait a minute. You might be thinking to yourself, I thought Syria was a pagan nation. I thought you had to be a follower of God to receive God's blessings. What we're learning here in this chapter, in this book, is God is not only the God of Israel, but the God of all nations. And what we see here is when Israel and Judah began to disobey God, when they began to become proud, when they began to find their own way and abandon God, God used other nations to rein in the Israelites and the people of Judah. God used these pagan nations to bring about His glory and His majesty, and one of the men He used was Naaman. So here's Naaman. He's a great leader. He's a man of valor. He has a great reputation. He has a great relationship with one of the most powerful men in the world, but there's an issue. He's a leper. Now, leprosy in our mind uh, immediately brings us to one specific skin disease, one illness, really a, a nerve uh, disorder. But leprosy in, in Scripture is much more vague, and it can refer to uh, many different types of skin illnesses, all extremely serious. Now, at this point, it seems like Naaman's issue was in the early stages. It's in the early stages. We can tell, for one reason, he's still allowed to be in public. Uh, most of the time, when you had a full bout of, of leprosy, uh, at least in, in the law of, of Moses, you had to wave your hands out and say, unclean, unclean. You did not want to spread this contagious disease. And we see that he's still able to be among the crowds, so perhaps and it's a place where he could cover it. Second, we read in verse 11 when he becomes angry. We'll get there in just a second. But he believed that Elisha would just wave his hand over the place. 
and he'd be healed. So these, these points kind of lead us to think, well, maybe these, this is in the early stages of the disease. In the midst of their raids against Israel, they captured a little girl. And she was to serve Naaman's wife. And I want you to catch this little girl, by the way. I want you to see who she is. That even though she is enslaved, even though she's forced to serve a pagan master and a pagan master's spouse, she still gives God the glory. She still shows compassion on her enemy. You remember what Jesus said, how we were to treat our enemies? With love. That we're to pray for them who spitefully use us and persecute us. And that's where this little girl's heart is. As she says, oh, if only Naaman was with the prophet of Israel, he could be healed. If only he was with the prophet that was in Samaria right now, Samaria being the capital of Israel, then he could be cured of his ailment. So she does two things. One, she shows compassion on her captor. And second, she gives glory to God. And so the wife tells this to Naaman, and he, and he tells it to the king, and the king writes to the king of Israel. And he says, I'm sending my special servant to you that you will cure him. Now the king dreaded this news. Syria was a great nation, much greater than Israel at this time, because again, Israel had forsaken God's laws and His commands. And, and, the, and the Israelite king, he began to grow fearful, saying, why is he sending me this man? Am I God that I can kill and make alive again? How am I supposed to heal this man? And he began to believe that he began to grow paranoid, thinking this is just an excuse. He's going to send his man down here. I won't be able to help him. And then he's going to start a war with me. I find it interesting that the king of the people of God was more fearful and less loyal than a little girl. This little girl who was enslaved had more faith in God and more humility than the king of Israel. That's just something again to note. So here comes Naaman. He has a dilemma. He, he finds out that there, there might be an opportunity for him to be healed. And he's going to take it because this is going to be fatal if he doesn't do anything about it. So here he comes with his entourage as we continue reading in verses 9 through 11, 9 through 12. So Naaman came with his horses and chariots and stood at the door of Elisha's house. And Elisha sent a messenger to him saying, Go and wash in the Jordan seven times, and your flesh shall be restored and you shall be clean. But Naaman was angry and went away, saying, Behold, I, I thought he would surely come out to me and stand and call upon the name of the Lord his God and wave his hand over the place and cure the leper. Aren't Abana and Farpar the rivers of Damascus, aren't they better than the waters of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in a rage. Now Elisha made a note to the king, and he, he wrote to the king that, You know, just send him my way. He'll know that there's a man of God in this nation. Just send him to me. So here comes Naaman. And he has his entourage. He has his power. He has his prestige. And he has his wealth. Notice that the king gave him ten talents of silver. Again, we, we, don't really, uh, we can't really fathom talents and shekels and weights. But I want you to know that when... The king Omri, when he first bought Samaria and he turned it into the capital of the king of Israel, he spent five talents of silver to purchase the land. So I want you to think about this kind of form of intimidation. That this man just comes along with twice the amount of money it costs to buy your whole city. Do you think he's making a point? And then that's just with the silver. He comes with all of these shekels, all of this, all of this money in order again to bring about a kind of intimidation and also to try to secure being made whole. Overall, all of the money, all the talents of silver and shekels of gold, it weighed almost 1,000 pounds, 900 pounds of money. When was the last time you weighed your money in pounds? I'm just, just curious. I, I don't know if I've ever done that. So here comes Naaman. And he has his chariots, and he has his people, and he has his servants, and those who announce his name to every side street he takes. And he's like the presidential motorcade going down a, a rundown neighborhood, and he's just showing his, his, all of his money and wealth, and he's probably in ornate clothing, and he has ten sets of cloth to, to give to the person who heals him. 
People must have been whispering, what's, what's happening? What's going on? They must have seen the Syrian uh, flags and the Syrian colors and think, are, are they going to attack us? So he rolls up on this poor prophet's home. And you can imagine him taking his time, getting out of his chair. You can imagine trumpets are blaring and people are saying, Behold Naaman, the servant of the greatest king in all the land. And they bring forth all the money and they bring forth all the cloth. And you can imagine almost that Naaman goes up to the door and he begins to knock on Elisha's door this day. A few minutes go by. Maybe the wind is rustling his cloth. Maybe the servants are kind of straining with all the weight of the gold in their hands. And finally, someone comes out the door and it's not the prophet. Okay, what the, the prophet wants you to do, just go to the Jordan seven times, wash yourself, and you'll be clean. Closes the door. How do you think Naaman felt? You don't have to wonder at all because Scripture tells us how he felt. He, he's in an outrage. He's, he's beyond disappointed. He says, how dare they? Do they know to whom they're speaking? That I'm the servant of the greatest king of all the lands? And where is this great prophet? Wasn't he supposed to come out and heal me? Couldn't he just call on the name of his God and, and waved his hand and I could have been miraculously healed? This wasn't what I expected it to be. Why is he sending me this nasty river? We, you know, we, we idolize the Jordan because we know that's where Jesus was baptized and that's where the Israelites crossed. There's a lot of historical moments. With the it was a nasty, muddy river. What about Farpar and, and the rivers of Damascus? What about the beautiful... What, what, what kind of standards does this guy have? And he went away and you think about how Scripture describes in a fit of rage. You know what we learn about him? He was slow to listen, quick to speak, and quick to wrath. Quick to anger. Why did Elisha do this? Why did Elisha have to make it so hard? Didn't Elisha seem kind of rude here? Elisha understood that before this man could be made whole, before he could be healed, he first had to be humble. He first had to experience humility. Let me tell you something this morning, church. You cannot go to God with trinkets and demand favors from Him. You cannot expect to barter, to purchase God's grace. You can't do it. God does not work on our timetable. He does not work according to our expectations, but in fact, He exceeds them all. But the last thing we can do is boldly go before the, the door and the throne of God and demand anything from Him. This is why I think Elisha stayed in his house. See, Naaman had come expecting to buy the ability to be healed. And Elisha knew that this man did not know God. It is not about me. It is not about the prophet. I myself cannot heal this man. It is only through the power of God alone. See, at the moment, this man's focus was on the man of God when he needed to be on God Himself. In like manner, again, we cannot barter, we cannot demand, we cannot purchase God's favor. We cannot expect God to work on our terms with our timetable. God resists the proud, but gives grace to whom? The humble. God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And as terminal as, as leprosy was, as dangerous as it is, Sin is far more destructive to the body and to the soul. It's one of the greatest barriers in evangelism is the inability to realize the enormity of sin, the danger of sin, and it is far more terrible, it's far more deadly than any physical ailment. Na uh, Naaman traveled over 100 miles from Syria to Samaria to find a cure. But when he's given a solution to his pain, he turns it away in a fit of rage because it's not convenient enough for him. It's not according to his expectations, so he refused to listen. And we have to ask ourselves the same this morning. Are we refusing to listen to God's call?
God has paved the way for us through the blood of His Son, that Jesus embraced the shame, the humiliation, the agony of the cross. Yet when God has shown us the road to salvation, sadly many reject it because it's too inconvenient. I, I thought all I needed to do was, was have God uh, wave His hand around me and I could be healed. I thought all I needed was, was just a simple prayer and that would be it. Faith without obedience is no faith at all. As we looked at this morning, it is a dead, useless faith. You know, this would be a sad story if these last two verses weren't in this chapter. Verses 13 and 14. Let's read it together. So he turned away and, and went away in a rage. But his servants came near and said to him, My father, it is a great word that the prophet has spoken to you. Will you not do it? Has he actually said to you, Wash and be clean? So he went and dipped himself seven times in the Jordan according to the word of the man of God. And his flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child. And he was clean. Before his servant spoke, Naaman's life was like a house of cards quickly falling apart. But then someone talked about a great thing. When Naaman resisted God, his servant spoke wisdom. If, if the prophet had asked you to do something great, Something majestic, something that really exerted yourself, would you not have done it? Do you think that he's trying to fool you? And in other words, they're saying, Naaman, what, what do you have to lose? What do you have to lose but to follow what he has to say? Sometimes what a person needs is a good friend willing to tell the truth. And we very well might be that friend. We have to be willing to speak honestly. We have to be willing to speak in humility and in love, but we have to be honest with those who are outside of Christ saying, do you expect something great? Do you expect something hard? Do you expect something difficult? Perhaps maybe salvation is a little too simple. It seems almost a little too easy. But that is what they're saying to Naaman. So Naaman has to make a decision. Am I willing to give up my life because I am too proud? Or will I give this a shot? See, there's a decision. There's a road that he had to take. So he went. I love that phrase. Those three words. A sign of humility and trust. So he went. And he dipped himself seven times in the Jordan according to the word of the man of God. And his flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child. His not just his leprosy, not just the spots or the boils or the, the whiteness, whatever, whatever kind of illness it happened to be. Not only was that gone, but any scars, any markings, he's like a little child. Let me ask you something, church. What healed Naaman? Was it the water? Was, was there really something secretive in the Jordan? What, maybe there's some kind of minerals. You know, if you go on, on a tour of the, the Holy Land, you can be baptized into the Jordan. And so a lot of people do that because they feel like they're embracing something and, and, and they feel like that they're getting closer to Jesus. Is there something in the water itself that makes you whole? Maybe it's at the right temperature. or maybe, maybe the seven times being dipped, maybe that's just the right amount of exposure to what you need to be made whole. Church, was it the water that saved him? No. Was it the fact that he went seven times? What, was it the repetition that saved him? Well, if not, then, then couldn't he have just gone to a, a, another river? Or couldn't he have just uh, held himself down one time, you know, and counted 10 Mississippis or something, and if he was down there long enough? Church, you're telling me if it's not the water that saved, it's not the repetition that saved, what saved him? His obedience and trust in the living God is what gave him access to the grace of God. We have to understand that Naaman first lost his temper. 
Then he lost his pride. And finally, he lost his leprosy. We have to lose our pride in order for us to lose our sin. When I think about this water, I'm going to let you know a secret. The elders told me not to tell you, but I'm going to let you know. There's nothing special about this water. We didn't, we didn't bless it. We didn't make it holy. It's water. At the same time, God has called all who desire to become a child of His to dip into the water once. You know, when I read in Scripture, I read in 2 Peter 1 verse 3, that God has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. He's given us everything that we could possibly need. Then when I read in James chapter 1, I read that if we're willing to lay aside the wickedness, the filth, and we're willing with meekness, with humility, to embrace the implanted word which is able to save our souls, we can be made whole. So when I read God has given us everything, and we can find salvation in following His word then what's hindering us from following His Word today? In Naaman, I see a man conflicted. I see a man who suffered from an ailment. But he was willing to let go and follow God according to the Word of God. Mankind is stricken with a spiritual ailment. It is, it is spread throughout the soul. It infects the mind. It affects the body. And if we do not do something about it, it will always 100% be fatal. However, God has given us everything we need and He has told us to embrace the Word which is able to save our souls and if we do so, we will be made fully whole. We will be made complete. Like I said, there's nothing special about this water here. What's special is we're following God's Word. So the question is, when God tells us, when Jesus said to baptize all nations, we read that the any type which now saves us is baptism. When we look at Mark 16, 16, and Jesus said, He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. Then why are we waiting? You know, Ananias, he, he asked Paul, uh, at that time, he's known as Saul. He said, why, why are you waiting? You've repented for three days. You haven't eaten anything for three days. You certainly call them Lord. You certainly believe in Him. Why are you waiting? Arise. Be baptized. Wash away your sins. Calling on the name of the Lord. Will we allow pride to become the permanent barrier between us and God? Will we not cast it off today? Will we allow it to take hold of us and forever separate us from the freedom God offers us this morning? Paul wrote in Romans 6, verse 17, But thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin became obedient from the heart, to the standard of teaching which you were committed. I think about Naaman. I think despite his prestige, but despite his power, his good standing with his master, he was a man in need and no one on the earth could help him except God. And at first he refused. In the end, he was clean. This morning God is waiting and he has called for you to embrace his teaching so you may be saved. Are you willing to be humble enough to accept His teaching? If you're a child of God and, and you have obeyed His Word, but perhaps you've been slipping away and, and maybe pride has stepped in and you think you don't really need to do what God has called for you to do, or maybe you have a temptation on your heart, maybe you just have a burden on your mind and you need prayer, don't be too proud today to admit you need help from God. We love you. We care about you. If you need anything at all, do not hesitate or wait. Come now while we stand and while we sing.